Thanks for being here and for your interest in learning how to handle money God's way. It is our prayer that this study will be enormously helpful as you move through the rest of your life. There are six chapters in this series, and each one is about 20 minutes long. The workbook is designed to help you learn God's way of handling money, apply it to your life, and multiply it into the lives of others. In each chapter, you will find three sections. The first is called Learn. It has a bunch of blank spaces for you to fill in keywords as you watch the video. You'll also answer questions and discuss them with others in your class. If you wish to dive in a little deeper, there is a second section called Apply. In this section, there's scripture to memorize, additional questions to answer, and a practical exercise to complete. And the third part is the Multiply section, helping you think through how you can take what you've learned and share it with others. Now, before you end each class, you may also want to take prayer requests and record these in the back of the workbook. Prayer and celebrating answers to prayer is a key component of our financial discipleship journey. So you may be surprised to learn that there are 2,350 verses dealing with money, and there are several reasons why the Lord says so much about it. First, how we handle money has a significant impact on our relationship with Christ. Jesus said it this way in Luke 16, 11. If therefore you are not faithful in the use of worldly wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And what are the true riches? A more intimate relationship with the Lord. Money is also a primary competitor with Christ for the Lordship of our life. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Lord also gives us direction on how to handle money. Scripture tells us how to earn, give, save, spend, invest, get out of debt, and teach children about money. In short, the Bible addresses every area of handling money, and the way most people handle money is so different from God's ways. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For your thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Not only are God's ways different, but they're also so much better. The next verse tells us, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Because followers of Jesus have not been trained to handle money God's way, they've adopted the world's perspective of handling money, and often with tragic consequences. So let's explore the responsibilities God has with money and the responsibilities we have. The Bible teaches that in finances, there's a division of responsibilities. God has a part and we have a part. So first, let's take a look at God's role. The Bible tells us that God owns it all. Psalms 24, one says, to the Lord, your God, belong the earth and is the Lord's and everything in it. And 1 Chronicles 29, 11 adds, everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord. So what do you own? Technically nothing. The Bible even identifies some of the items that God owns. Leviticus 25, 23 tells us that he owns all the land. Haggai 2, 8 says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. And then in Psalms 50 verse 10, the Lord says, every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. As creator and owner of all things, God never transferred the ownership of his creation to people. We're simply stewards and managers of what he's entrusted to us. In fact, if we're going to be genuine followers of Jesus, we must transfer the ownership of all our possessions to the Lord. In Luke 14, 33, Jesus said, no one can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. If you think you own something, it will show up in your attitude. If things go well with it, you'll be happy. But if something goes wrong, not so much. The first step in learning contentment is recognizing God is the owner of all your possessions. As we acknowledge God's ownership, we no longer ask, Lord, what do you want me to do with my money? The question becomes, Lord, what do you want me to do with your money? When we have this perspective, spending and saving decisions are equally as spiritual as giving decisions. The second responsibility God has is ultimate control of every event. First Chronicles 29, 11 says, we adore you as being in control of everything. We will examine this verse a little further in a bit. God's third responsibility is his promise to provide for our needs. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, meaning food and clothing shall be added unto you. In Genesis, God is spoken of as Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. 
He takes care of his people and he doesn't need a prosperous economy to provide for them. Every day for 40 years, God provided manna to the children of Israel while they wandered in the wilderness. And Jesus fed 5,000 people with only five loaves and two fish. God is both predictable and unpredictable. He is absolutely predictable in his faithfulness to provide, but we can't predict how he'll provide. Sometimes God uses surprising ways of meeting our needs. He may increase our income, provide a gift, stretch our resources through money-saving purchases, but however he chooses to provide, one thing is sure, he is totally reliable. A lot of people have a hard time grasping God's part because we tend to shrink him down to our own human abilities. But the Bible reveals who God really is. He hung the stars in space. He created Earth's towering mountains and mighty oceans. And yet, He knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He's also closely and personally involved with us. Psalm 139 says, You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. So let's review God's part. He is the owner. He is in control of every circumstance and He has promised to meet our needs. Now, our responsibility is found in 1 Corinthians 4.2, which says, It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. There are two things we need to understand about being faithful. Although many of us have heard about how to handle 10% of our income, the area of giving, most of us haven't heard anything about the other 90% and what God says about it. Failing to understand God's way of handling money often leads to poor financial decisions and some very painful consequences. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The second thing to understand about faithfulness is that God asks us to be faithful in little things. Check out Luke 16, 10. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. If we develop the character of being faithful in small things, the Lord knows He can trust us with greater responsibilities. Remember this, small things are small things, but faithfulness with a small thing is a really big thing. This study was appealing to us as we were really excited to learn how to better manage our money, but it turned out to be so much more. We thought we were doing okay, making ends meet, but we were wasteful in our spending and missed a lot of opportunities to be generous. In fact, Throughout the study, we realized we were actually stealing from God by not giving back what was His. We started to notice how our attitude towards money was making us hostile, and we didn't like it. We decided to let go and surrender everything we owned to the Lord. This was the game changer. We began managing our finances God's way and soon began to see where we were falling short spiritually. Continually seeking His will kept us accountable and motivated us to be faithful stewards. We even started using a budget. Woo! We are grateful for this study and look forward to continuing to grow on this financial discipleship journey. On your financial discipleship journey, there'll be one constant, a variety of people offering a variety of advice on how to handle your finances in a variety of ways. Some of this may be great, and some of this may be absolutely terrible. So before we dig deep into topics such as debt, savings, giving, and investing, it's crucial that you're equipped with a filter to seek and receive advice that honors the Lord and empowers you on our financial discipleship journey. The Bible encourages us to seek counsel. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. The purpose of counsel is to get insights and suggestions that would help us in making good decisions. And whenever we're making financial decisions, we should consult three sources of advice. First is the counsel of the Lord. In Isaiah 9, 6, we're told that one of the Lord's names is Wonderful Counselor. In Psalm 32, 8, the Lord tells us, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. 
I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The Lord's counsel comes to us through prayer, directly from his word and through others. It is important to remember that only the Lord knows the future and the ultimate consequence of a decision. And he wants us to seek his direction. The second source is the Bible. Psalm 119, 24 reads, your laws are both my light and my counselors. The Bible makes this remarkable claim about itself in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible is a living book that our Lord uses to communicate his directions to all generations. If the scriptures answer my question, I don't have to go any further because it contains the Lord's revealed will. If the Bible isn't specific about an issue, we can go to a third source of counsel, godly people. Proverbs 15:22 reads, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. Each of us has limited knowledge and experience. We need the input of others who bring their unique backgrounds and give us insight and spark our thinking with ideas we'd never have considered without their advice. Now this is for you married folks. Your spouse should be a primary source of counsel. A husband and wife are one. They need each other to make great decisions. Seeking the counsel of your spouse also helps your relationship because you both experience the consequences of a decision. If you both agree about a decision, even if it proves to be disastrous, your relationship is more likely to remain intact. So seek the counsel of your spouse, always. Now let's look at counsel we shouldn't seek. Psalm 1, 1 says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. A wicked person lives their life without regard for God. In our opinion, we can seek technical inputs such as legal advice from those who don't know Jesus, but our final decision should be based on the counsel of godly people. The Bible also tells us never to seek counsel from fortune tellers, mediums, or psychics. Leviticus 19.31 says, do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. We should also avoid any method they use in forecasting the future, such as horoscopes and all other occult practices. Well, as we've seen, seeking counsel is important. So I pray that you ask the Lord to bring you at least one godly person who can walk alongside you and advise you during your financial discipleship journey. Years ago, during my time as a business partner serving as CFO, we were looking to finance some expensive items. During the closing on one of these transactions, I was asked to provide a personal guarantee. The other two partners signed without a second thought, but I had a bad feeling about it. I signed it with the worst version of my signature that I'd ever signed, but it was done and I didn't give it much thought until five years later, I received a letter telling me I was being sued for $75,000 on the financing agreement I had co-signed five years earlier. I couldn't believe it. I called an attorney friend who looked at the letter and didn't see any way out of it. As I shared this news with my wife, she reminded me of Proverbs 6, 1 through 5, from the study we had taken earlier, that basically says if you have co-signed, do whatever you can to free yourself from it. As I read it and reread it, I was convinced that I needed to ask the creditor to forgive me of my obligation. My attorney reluctantly arranged for me to speak with the creditor's attorney. I began by telling them I was a Christian and had been taught some biblical teaching that addressed the matter of co-signing. I read the proverb passages to him, acknowledged that I had agreed to a personal guarantee and asked to be released from it because that's what God's word told me to do. There was a silence for what seemed like an eternity. Then the creditor's lawyer said, I'll discuss this with my client and he hung up. Three days later, my attorney called me and said he had got a call from the creditor's counsel and they would settle the whole thing for $4,000. <gasps> I was dumbfounded. I immediately called my wife and told her the news. We prayed about it and felt complete peace that this was God's will to put it behind us and learn from the experience. I mailed them a check the next day. God's word is true, and if we live by it, we'll avoid lots of trouble.
I know from my experience.